Pariegak. Good afternoon. Um, it took a revolution, but we filled the hall. <laughs> and we're here, all of us together, and everybody on Facebook Live, and everybody on the live stream in English and the live stream in Armenian, to talk about the most fundamental of topics, Armenia tomorrow. And it's not an abstract conversation, you know, the way we have over beer and wine and coffee. This is real, and it's real because it was brought about by the events that culminated after a couple of weeks in April, exactly 30 years from when we went through this the first time. I don't know how many people get a second chance, but we've got one. Some of us stayed up here all night watching. I understand insomnia was a thing in LA last month. Some of us got calls from relatives in Armenia. Some just got caught up with it because it made the international press. And so we started talking, they started talking about this unique thing that happened in Armenia. And we didn't say it was unique for a change. The world did. I saw it in Yerevan and I followed it on the faces of the young people I worked with. And the combination of hope, energy, and excitement about the uncertainties, it was overwhelming. The participants are the guests who you'll see here on stage and via Skype. We'll be asking all sorts of questions. Um, let me answer a couple of things, though. A couple of basic questions first. One about the length of this program and continuity. The Institute of Armenian Studies is very fortunate to be at a university. It wasn't accidental, by the way. That's, that was the intent. And our job is to ask questions and to support those looking for answers. And this is the beginning. It's just the first tiny step in a process that we hope is going to go on for a long, long time. There's a reason we're calling this Armenia tomorrow, because there are going to be many tomorrows to come. For some of you, 13 people in two and a half hours is going to be way too little. And for some of you, it's going to be way too much. And I'm hoping it's just right to start. And I think, I hope, that none of us are expecting anyone to have answers and formulas so quickly. Not even the Varchabed, who's going to be online with us in a couple of minutes. We don't even know what questions to ask yet. You know, in 1988, 1991, when we should have been asking those questions, if you remember, some of you weren't around, but the rest of us, we didn't ask questions. Not in Armenia, not in the diaspora. We had war, we had earthquake, we had economic collapse. We just lived through it. We didn't ask what kind of Armenia do we want. You've noticed the Prime Minister's chant during the protests went from Azad Anga Hayastan to Azad Artar Hayastan, from free and independent Armenia to free and just Armenia. That's a choice. It doesn't have to be an either or. We probably can manage to strive for a few things at once. But it's a choice, right? What do we want? What do we want? Do we want an educational system in this new Armenia that produces people ready for employment? Or do we want an educational system that continues to support the arts and the literature the way Armenian education has and the way the world believes citizens are made? Do we want an Armenia where the diaspora is an equal partner? Or do we want an Armenia where the responsibility and the rights belong to those who actually live there, pay taxes, and serve in the army? Is this an Ar Armenia that is open to immigrants from anywhere? Or is this an Armenia that is going to try to maintain its homogeneity, its insularity? Is this an Armenia that is an active part of a real region, actively collaborating with Iran and Georgia, and living in peace with Turkey and Azerbaijan? Or is this an Armenia that will deepen its interdependencies with Russia? What do European values mean? Do we want better relations with Europe in order to travel more easily? Or do we really want the values of tolerance, of inclusivity, and of critical thinking? And why are we asking? 
We're asking because it's by asking and exploring and studying and weighing and judging and choosing. That's how we go from politics to policy, from the street to institutions. So many of you have said over these last several weeks, is this it? We're gonna go back to the street every time a decision needs to be made? A country's institutions have to work, or the only thing that's left is the street. Is the street going to be this government's recourse? The world's experience is that if the institutions don't work, if media doesn't work, if the educational system doesn't work, if elections don't work, if city councils don't work, then yeah, you go to the street. But they have to work, and it's the job of the academy, the scholars, to feed those institutions with facts, with analysis, and with options. So today, with these great specialists whose names you have in the program, and with others who aren't here but aching to get involved, we commit to supporting asking these questions. The questions that some of you will hear later today and throughout the months to come. Our commitment is that this isn't a one-off, that this is the beginning of a long process to break down each aspect of life in a democratic society. The judiciary, legislation, taxes, the diaspora, local governance, the list is long. And we will break it down and tackle them each, not necessarily at public gatherings like this, probably mostly online, because now the Institute has a media center thanks to the generosity of two members of our leadership council. So we will be able to do more of these, more urgently, immediately, with more of you engaged. And I want to thank the Leadership Council. You know, I don't spend a lot of time thanking people from stage. I just figure we all do what we do because this is what we choose to do. But I really want to say a huge thanks to the Leadership Council and the donors of the Institute because without them, this wouldn't be possible. Two weeks ago, we said, you know, we think we can pull this off. And they said, sure. So thank you. You know who you are, and the rest of you are off there watching us from somewhere. Thank you. Thank you to our staff. This is a two-week process, as you know. We did it. We pulled it off. Silva Sevlian, Susanna Bedrosian, Geram Mognetsian, Lilith Keshishian, Asi Gekikian, a great crew of absolutely. A great crew of students and volunteers. Anybody who says hello to me ends up volunteering, and I'm grateful to you. And we're thankful to you, because not only are you here or watching from somewhere, but you also, by being here, I think, whether you know it or not, have agreed to be flexible with us. This is a tough call today. Um, we took a risk on trying to get both the prime minister and the president online. We have succeeded in one of two, in two ways. Uh, we are going to speak to the Prime Minister now, live, in a minute. And to conclude this program, we have a Q&A with the President pre-recorded. That we couldn't pull off by Skype, but the first part with new Prime Minister Nigol Pashinyan, we're ready to get into right now if you're ready. Baron Varchabet, Los Angeles, see how mine I'll do this and then I'll translate myself and then we'll do the Q&A, half in English, half in Armenian. Baron Varchabet, Shachnor Agalutu. Los Angeles, see how mine co, Inchbeskidek, Harn Hamainke, Hayastanits, Lipananits, Syriaits, Parskastanits. Եվ աշխարի փոլոր անգյուններից, ում եմ թուրս տողել, հանստվածքի դե։ Եվ փոլորը այս տեղներ գայացված են, եվ այս շնորավորանքները գալիս են փոլորից։ Շնորագալություն, որ մեզ ժամանակ դրամատրեցիք։ Ես եմ շնորադ 
Uh, I'm going to ask the questions in English after we give the Prime Minister a couple of minutes to say anything he wishes. We will ask him to do it in sentences, in spurts, so that we can translate it for you in English. And then, with the Prime Minister's permission, I will ask him a couple of questions, and then we will move off with our political scientists. So, the floor is yours. In German, I am very thankful for this opportunity to be here with you today, and I am feeling from this distance that the warmth that you're sending from me, and I am very gratified with that warmth. Uh, <laughs> As you mentioned, Los Angeles is diverse with Armenians from everywhere, including Syria, Iran, the Middle East. And I have to say that during this past month, during this process, I have crossed paths with Armenians from Syria, from Europe, from Greece, from Cyprus, who are as much part of this process, of this transition, as are the residents of Armenia. Yes, I որովհետև այս գործընթացի ժամանակ եւ Երևան ու եւ Երևանից դուրս տեսել են եւ զգացել են ցուցունը I am mentioning this to highlight the pan-Armenian nature of this movement because during this process in Yerevan and outside of Yerevan we have felt that the gravity of that movement Yevsa as pastov inkni batsahaytvum et tegin mtsoghi eutsune yev ints hamar sa arachin yertin haykakan petatsan hayastani petatsan imas nu nshanatsune chzgrtelu tatse and for me personally this is a process of identifying the true meaning of armenian statehood of Armenian, the nation, and the national problems. Yep, Gitek Shadir Karja in the Kartsum and Meli Shaterin, me hearts a head up, me hearts a tanju, ever cho in Chihamare Hayastana, Yev in Chupet Hayastani Harap, Goitun Unen. For a very long time, I have been struggling to define that question, why or what is the purpose of an Armenian state, of its existence as such? And I found the answer to my question in the preamble of the Armenian constitution, which during the past three changes of the constitution has stayed intact and has not changed. And 
And what is the intriguing part in this? That the creator, the founder of the Armenian Republic serves as the Armenian people, people as a whole serve as the founder of the Republic. I, wa I want to pay a very particular attention to the fact that it's not just the citizens of the Republic of Armenia, not the citizens of the former Re Soviet Republic of Armenia, but the Armenian nation as a whole serves as the founder of the Republic of Armenia. And the true meaning of the existence of an Armenian Republic, of an Armenian stand, is this cornerstone. And the particular meaning is that, that the Armenian state has to serve as the grounds where the social, financial, uh, brain power and all of the major powers of the Armenian nation could be utilized and safeguarded. Or the very significant part of it. Uh, and the strategic outcome of this question for us is the main challenge for us is to turn back the millennia long immigration problem of our nation, to, uh, to turn back this wheel to get people back to meet and solve these challenges. And for to achieve this goal, we saw uh, one serious prerequisite that the uh, Armenian citizen had to be the absolute power in the Armenian state. And through, we were able to achieve that goal in order to kickstart the solution of our, all of our other problems. And we should consider this as the cornerstone for Armenia's tomorrow and future prospects. In, in the Armenia, citizens of Armenia have to decide who is going to be their ruling government. And who should stop being their ruling government? This is the most important point in our current political discourse. Which is in itself not a, a project in its entirety for Armenia's future. But is a very strategically important method to achieve that goal. 
քննարկում եւ ընտրություն եւ մարտիկ հնարավորություն են որոշելու եւ որ կա բարավեջի արթակ եւ օրինական ժողովրդական հասարակություն եւ իշխանպետություն նրա բովանդության ապահովումը դառնում է հնար քննարկումների բանավեճերի եւ տեսակետների because when there is a discussion and choice and debate and a just society the realization of such problems and challenges becomes seizable can i interrupt and ask you some questions about those ayo yes auzumem yevs mek ankan vorsukel vori yev asel vor zer yakutsuna vchrakan nshakutsun e unetsel mer ais khaghakam tsesi akhtanaki hamut I, I want to congratulate you all and mention that your support has played a vital role in the success of our struggle. Mr. Prime Minister, you know better than anyone that in Armenia and also in the diaspora, the expectations are out the window and what everyone citizens and non-citizens are going to look for is an understanding of your priorities and the way in which you intend to move forward can you help us understand that iharke yes arten hens arashnayertsar vorotev menk hamuzvat hayastani սխալ ճանապարհ անալի գործընթացը սկսել է այն պահի երբ սկսվել է հիմնադրել ընտրությունների կեղծման համակարգ I already spoke of the, our priorities because we were convinced that the present challenges and problems facing Armenia emanate from the fact that elections were systematically rigged over the period of past 30 years mes amar amenak arshna hertutyuna anshrjeli nel azat arta shortavarak antrutyunneri institut the priority for us is the establishment of just and honorable and transparent elections and elect- electoral institutions in the republic of armenia որպեսի որևէ ընտրությունների արդյունքներ բաստատի տակ չկերպեն որևէ մեկ so that nobody has any intention or in any way could challenge the legitimacy of our future elections եւ հենց էսա ճանապարհը որպեսի մեր կարծիքով հակացիները իրենց կան երկրի տեղ իրավունքի տեղ ազատության տեղ Եվ օրենքի And this is the way how the citizens of the Republic of Armenia are going to feel themselves as the owners of their country and the group that is going to set their future path. Ինքնիշխան քաղաքացին, ինքնիշխան պետության եւ աշխավորն է։ Ինքնիշխան քաղաքացին օրինականության եւ օրենքի իշխանության եւ աշխավորն է։ Սա է մեր առ a sovereign citizen is a guarantor of sovereignty and a sovereign citizen is who sets the just and honorable path for its people so yes thank you for your time and the law just government and just rule so in your answer uh, you are assuming a continuing sustained awareness and ownership by all of the nation armenians in armenia and armenians in the diaspora that that citizenship ownership idea continue not just when they're in the street but also to hold your government and the next governments accountable is that 
իհար կե տեսեք եթե մենք խոսում ենք ազատ ծուների մասին ի վերջո ընտրությունը ոչ միայն իշխանություն ներով ինչ որ քաղաքական ուժի բերել իշխանության այնպես էլ ազատ արտահայտ կտրություններով այդ ուժին հերցնել Of course when we are speaking of free election free elections means that those can either bring a certain political power to power but also can remove a certain political force from power so through that what we mean is to transparent electoral institutions people can elect a certain political force into power and then as easily be able to remove. In the first time, I was able to remove the political force from power. մեր կառավարության ամենակարևոր առաջնահերթությունը դառնալ ժողովրդի ինստիտուցիոնալ իշխանության երաշխավորը And why do I give such prominent importance to this question because I strongly believe that all root of our problem is the falsification of our elections and I see the uh, organization of transparent electoral institutions as the guarantor of people's institutional power. So how do we go from election to election, in between elections, how do we sustain a citizen's engagement and involvement in Armenia and through the diaspora? How do we continue to engage? <laughs> հետո քաղաքացիների ներգրավված հոբելու խնդիրը ծիրը մենք չունենք որովհետև սա իսկական քաղաքացիական եւ ազգային զարթոն եւ այդ զարթոնքի կան հիությունը հետեւյալն է յուրաքանչյուր քաղաքի պայքարի եւ իրավունքի եւ ապացան համար քաղաքացին իր ծեր Եվ սա ամեն աշխիքն է, որ նրանք կլինեն ներգրավված։ Ինչ վերաբերվում է ներգրավվածությունը, այստեղ մենք ի խնդիրներ ունի։ Օրինակ Հայաստան սամատ բայ կներեք։ Շնորհակալություն։ Գեղա։ You know after these changes people's participation will no longer be an issue because this is a national popular awakening and awoke citizens will be involved in the changes that will guarantee their future. We, we don't see such a problem in the uh, involvement of the diaspora either. ու վերջին 5 տարու վերջին 4 տարու հանդիսացել է միայն հայաստան ուսուցիչ քաղաքացի եւ մշտապես վերջին տարու մշտապես բնակվել է հայաստանի հարաբերություն Our constitution states that ministers in cabinet ministers could be appointed people who in the past 4 5 years have been exclusively citizens of Armenia and have resided in Armenia Մենք կարծում ենք որ այս կարգավորումը չի արտահայտում մեր ազգային ցտումները եւ կարծում ենք որ այս սահմանափակումը ստեղծում է արհեստական փորձներ սփյուրքի ներգրավված We think that this distinction does not reflect our national condition and then this restriction restricts the certain parts of our diasporan society to part, have direct participation in Armenian Մենք մտածիր ենք այս արգելները վերացնել որտեղի սփյուրքի ներուժը նահավորություն ունենանք օգտագործել պետական կարգման եւ պետական ներկայացման որ 
We are determined to alleviate these restrictions so that we can harness the full potential of diasporan involvement in Armenia. Thank you very much. That's a great point to end on. I know the audience is going to blame me for ending this conversation here, but uh, I have to do that. So, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you again on behalf of all of us watching and all of us ready. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. This is a moment of national pan-Armenian awakening, and we, it shall not be missed. And I hope to meet all of you in, in those, your communities soon in person to discuss these challenges and find outcomes. And because the diaspora is not as democratic as Armenia yet, on behalf of all of us, I give myself the right to invite you formally, if and when you wish. Thank you again. That worked out well. We can come off the pins and needles now. Um, we are going to begin with the first segment of our program, and just to tell you how lucky the Institute is, with the support it gets from throughout the university, we have two professors who are going to moderate the first half and the second half of this program. The first half's moderator is Professor Rob English, who just got married yesterday. And he's here anyway. And joining him are five individuals, all of whose biographies are in your booklets. I'm not going to take the time to read them all, although they deserve far more. I simply want to say that between Maria Garabedian, who's going to be on Skype, an activist involved in the month that was April, whom you saw on the platform several times, as well as the four guests who are going to be here. Katie Pierce, who studied social media even before it changed the course of Armenian history. Uh, Anna Ohanian, and uh, Anna Ohanian, who is a political scientist from Massachusetts, who studies state formation, democratic processes, and two individuals who are going to talk to us about the world. Faez Hamad, who is a professor of uh, political science here at USC, specifically about the Middle East and politics of the Middle East. And you remember there was a spring there a few years ago. And Mr. David Usupashvili, who was head of Georgia's parliament just a few years ago. And when I got him on line on email about three o'clock in the morning and asked him to commit. He said yes, right away, back and forth. And by four, I said, doesn't anybody in the caucuses sleep? Because as you know, nobody in Armenia sleeps at two or three in the morning. He said, the caucuses has been asleep long enough. So I welcome Professor Rob English and our wonderful guests. Thank you. My job is just to set the stage for our expert participants, and I just have two things to do before I turn the floor over to them. One is something optimistic and happy. One is something pessimistic. The first is once again simply to salute Salpi and the Armenian Institute. You see how special they are and how remarkable the events they organize have always been. I have chaired.
I have chaired or participated in literally dozens, maybe hundreds, of post-Soviet, Russian, Eastern Europe transition-oriented events. And you never see this combination of energy, insight, but especially the juxtaposition of analysts and activists, right, of policy makers with policy analysts, the people who discuss and analyze and actually do it. And that's what Salby and her crew organize all the time. In fact, they themselves are both analysts and activists. That was the positive. The negative in setting the stage for our conversation now um, is to remind how difficult the path is ahead. It was only a few years ago, the ecstasy, the anticipation, the soaring joy of the events in Ukraine, I mean the Euromaidan revolution of 2014. And very quickly, that transition became mired in corruption, cynicism, and a revanche of the oligarchic old guard that having stoked the forces of right-wing nationalism is in some ways even worse than what went before. At least that's what many Ukrainians feel who rank their current government and their current prospects even lower than those of the regime they so recently overthrew. That was the Aero Maidan, but just a decade before that was the Orange Revolution, which similarly became mired in its own corruption and crippling infighting among erstwhile allies in democratization. And other so-called color revolutions in the former Soviet Union have been followed by similar disappointments, from the Caucasus to Central Asia, and even further abroad, from the countries convulsed by the so-called Arab Spring to what we only recently believed were the most successful and consolidated demo democratic transition countries in Central Europe. Now democracy seems to be on the retreat everywhere. As I said, the revanche of oligarchic business interests, the dangers of inflaming nationalism or ethnic hatred, splits between the urban and rural citizen citizenry of these countries, a whole range of factors have complicated these transitions. So with this gloomy but necessary introductory caution, the questions I want to pose to our panelists are what can we learn from these previous democratic revolutions, these transitions, including how they went awry? What were their main domestic and foreign policy mistakes? And how can Armenia's democratic revolution avoid the same fate and succeed where others have failed? To begin, I'm going to turn to Anna Ohanian, Professor Ohanian, and ask to focus in on the nature of Armenia's democratic revolution constitutional, extra-constitutional, peaceful or violent. What do we know? What have we learned from what's underway right now? And optimism sure. or pessimism? Thank you. Uh, before I start, I should simply state how humbling it has been to observe what has transpired in Armenia. And so I'll be used the word unique. Um, I think that word is definitely justified. Um, Armini the social movement in Armenia that developed the democratic transition, whatever we call it, mass scale civil disobedience, it was unique because it was unfolding in an overall highly authoritarian regional neighborhood. Uh, the bright side, however, is that now there is a democratic dyad in South Caucasus with Armenia and Georgia hopefully will be mutually reinforcing. Uh, globally, uh, just to echo to what Professor English just mentioned, uh, authoritarianism is definitely um, uh, increasing. Number of transitions to authoritarianism are much higher but than democratic transitions. And uh, this is where Armenian movement, Armenian social movement is so unique because it offers a very specific pathway for many uh, countries that are stuck in between democracy and, and authoritarianism, hybrid regimes, a way out. Um, I'm very optimistic as to where uh, this is headed. Um, studies show that the type of the democratic transition uh, 
uh, determines the durability, democratic durability, whether, uh, partic whether a particular transition will succeed and will consolidate is very much dependent on its roots. How did it develop? Transitions that are um, more big bang, uh, that are top down, elite driven, come in big waves, they usually do not have a good uh, track record of consolidating democratic outcomes. In the case of Armenia, this was strategically peaceful, uh, it was grassroots, um, uh, and it was highly institutional. These are the three features of this transition that I think will uh, have created a wonderful, solid foundation for Armenia to consolidate its democracy. And in this respect, I would like us to and again, I quote Professor English, get us out of the post-Soviet geopolitical context. The movement in Armenia is unique, but I think in terms of its democratic transition component, it is very, very comparable to democratic transitions in Latin, some Latin American countries in 1970s and 80s, or in Spain, which is considered the gold standard of how to consolidate democracy. Because the movement was so decentralized and so grassroots, roots, um, it essentially uh, produces a very solid uh, civic engagement which is needed in order to prevent authoritarian resurgence. This is something that the Prime Minister also mentioned, put in simple words, awakening, civic awakening. That's a political resource that is going to come in handy. And in terms of the institutional dimension, and I will stop uh, on this note, um, uh, not only this current transition, uh, this current uh, social movement, but also prior episodes of peaceful protests in Armenia struggling with the hybrid regime, uh, institutional levers were used even though they were fraudulent, even though the electoral regime uh, was compromised. Um, again, looking at situations in Latin America as well as in Spain, those democratic transitions succeeded, the ones that worked within this uh, flawed constitutional order, and that essentially allowed to keep the movement uh, uh, peaceful, but also to reach out to groups that might have been benefiting from the previous authoritarian regime, but now need to be brought into the broader fold. Thank you. I'm gonna turn next to David Usopashvili and remind the audience that in 2003, after more than a decade of stagnant post-Soviet authoritarian rule, the Rose Revolution brought to power the people, swept aside after a stolen election, the old guard, and the government of President Mikhail Saakashvili came to power. What lessons from the Georgian experience, what to do, what to avoid, would you highlight for Armenia today? Thank you very much, everybody, for allowing me to be here today with you and share these emotions and expectations all of us have about future, about tomorrow of Armenia. Uh, and these re recent events uh, demonstrated once again that Armenians are very wise people. Because <laughs> they... because they skipped these first waves of democratic revolutions in the region, color revolutions. They skipped the second wave of revolutions, Arab Spring. Mm. Why? In order to observe, to analyze <laughs> what went right, what went wrong, <laughs> and to make successful revolution, and I wish that that's the case. And uh, in the coming future, we will see that, yes, Armenians are uh, reach with their own experience and knowledge, and also they shared everything what was going on in the region. And yes, Georgians and I myself were more than ready to contribute to this very important thing. Why? Because I love Armenia more than Georgia? No, I love Georgia more than Armenia. But mm -hmm. I know that prosperous Georgia, democratic Georgia, stable Georgia is impossible without stable, democratic, prosperous Armenia. Yeah, that's, amazing. that's why it's our joint effort. Therefore, I'm more than ready to share uh, mistakes as well. Yes, in 2003, something happened very important in Georgia, and that was very successful during the first years. Why it was very successful? Why modernization was so fast? Why petty corruption was defeated in the country? Why corruption became a matter of shame, not a matter of pride, as it was before? Because we had political leaders who had the vision, 
And we had political team who had division. We had the team which had experience. Since 95, the team who led to the revolution uh, were considered as uh, reformist wing of Shevardnadze's government. And they already introduced many reforms in judiciary, in uh, making more transparent public uh, money spending and so and so. So that was a very important thing. We, no, we, we had not just the understanding what we did not want anymore, but we knew what we want exactly, because this blueprint was created. In 2000, we created very complex anti-corruption program, which Shevardnadze did not do, but Saakashvili did. That's why it succeeded. Therefore, it is very important to see very soon that Armenia is led by a team which has common vision and common program which they want to implement in the country. Second, very important ingredient of the success was the international support. Uh, all strategic partners of Georgia saluted that revolution and supported its outcome, and we are ready to go as far as Georgians would uh, um, be able in terms of democratization, modernization, and so on. This is a very key issue for Armenia now, whether all the strategic partners will be equally motivated and supportive to the change which is started in Armenia. And probably there are some uh, things to consider how to navigate in this situation, how to make sure that Armenia becomes modern, democratic, westernized uh, state, and it keeps its strategic partnership with the countries it has to keep, but those countries are not making obstacles, at least some of them. This is a very important thing. Now, the Rose Revolution finally ended with some not very uh, good achievements. In 2012, in fact, uh, there was kind of um, the, 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 the reaction on the revolution because the uh, last years were not as good. Why? And I would make three important points, and I would ask and urge Armenian leadership not to repeat that. First, unfortunately, the revolution for many meant fight of good people against bad people, and not fight of good policies against bad policies. This must not be repeated. <laughs> Second, the new government came to the power without exit strategy. And this is very important. It could be sounding very crazy. The people have not entered yet to the power system, and I'm talking about exit strategy. But it is important to have exit strategy. What means is that every single country needs not one set of good people who are capable to govern the country, but other sets of the people who can come and do this job, meaning the peaceful change of the government through the elections must be possible. And this must be demonstrated by the new government, by the new leaders. They should avoid the same mistake when everything good and uh, everything uh, necessary is associated to the one man or one team. Such good Bolshevism, because Bolshevism is Bolshevism, it cannot be good. And that's why the government must demonstrate that they came to, for doing good things, but they are not the sole actors in Armenia, and they are supporting the other institutions which need to come there. And there's third point, very important one. The Prime Minister mentioned this, that citizens are the owners of the country, and they must become the owners of the country. Yeah, that's very important, because Georgia and Armenia and some other countries also. We jumped from the concept of communist comrades to voters of democracy. We skipped the very important concept of citizen. Hmm. And governments do not treat the people as citizens. Government treat people as voters who will vote during the elections and ensure the uh, continuation of the power. Yes, that's a very key component of it, to make out of each single Armenian person a citizen of Armenia. And that's a huge job of the new leadership. Thank you.
Professor Hamad, whatever strikes you of primary importance from the experience of the so-called Arab Spring for Armenia today? Well, thank you, Rob, and I'm glad uh, and delighted to be here. Uh, well, unfortunately, the Arab Spring turned into a very deep, uh, cold, and long winter. Uh, so I'm here to deliver the so not so rosy news in the hope that the Armenian case uh, will avoid the pitfall that the Arab Springs have experienced. Uh, let me preface by saying that the forces and actors that led to the protest in Armenia uh, that caused the toppling of the government are not necessarily the same forces and dynamics that will <clears throat> determine uh, the path uh, moving forward uh, or the end result of that protest. Uh, another way, one way to see it, if, if, this, if what is the events in Armenia for the last two to three weeks are the introductory chapter of a story, the story of Armenia, the uh, uh, subsequent chapters and the conclusion uh, most likely will be uh, written, if at least not, uh, if at least not co-written by other actors and, and players. Uh, and with that in mind, I just want to outline and identify three uh, factors that uh, came uh, of importance in the Arab Spring in the hope, again, the Armenian case is able to avoid them. The first one is the role of the, uh, the um, role of the military uh, and the security apparatuses. Uh, in the Arab Spring, uh, the uh, military refused uh, orders to shoot in the Tunisian case, uh, prompt and for, you know, compelling the president to flee the country and usher uh, a transition. In Libya, the military split, and it took the intervention of NATO to decide the outcome of the uh, former regime uh, and perhaps you know there is the history of that story. Uh, in, the, um, in the case of Armenia, it is most fortunate uh, for Armenians and everybody who cares about uh, you know, human uh, rights and uh, political developments in a democratic fashion, uh, it's more fortunate that uh, the outgoing prime minister did not give orders to the, mili the military to shoot. And perhaps if the Armenian story is uh, to fold in the way we want it to, to end, at least uh, from our perspective, uh, this, I think, will have a, a far more consequential impact moving forward than what is currently appreciated. Uh, but if you consider the military role in, in a country like Egypt, where the military refused uh, orders to shoot, thus uh, determining the fate of the former President Mubarak, and the military as a result of that move was seen as the champion and on the side of the people. But it was the same military that a year later uh, be, uh, decided to implement its own agenda that was not seen by many Egyptians initially and did not have a problem at all to shoot 1,000 Egyptians dead on one day in broad daylight uh, to assume power and to double and to overthrow the first elected, uh, democratically elected government in, in Egypt. So I just want to keep that in mind, particularly given the Karabakh issue in Armenia, where it introduces a, a, a level of militarization uh, that impacts the uh, society and the polity of Armenia. And as such, one needs to be mindful of that and not to lose sight of it. Uh, the other uh, issue I wanted to bring uh, from the cases uh, of the Arab Spring is the role of sectarianism and schisms. Uh, the old regimes, otherwise, they've entrenched themselves for so long, and the Armenian case is not different for 30 years since the first attempt, and these entrenched interests do not go, uh, unfortunately, peacefully. They have interest, and they want to protect them, and they perhaps, they always have the, uh, the ability to perhaps reassemble themselves. So with that, one needs to be careful of the potential creation of fault lines, and I don't know exactly in the Armenian case what could that be, but it could be as simple as beginning to create the schisms among Armenians of the need for stability uh, or, uh, you know, order, as opposed to, uh, you know, instability and chaos and so forth. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Uh, the third and last uh, dynamic I wanted to bring to your attention is the uh, role and, uh, of the external factors, the intervention uh, of these uh, regional actors. Uh, in the Arab case, uh, that superseded the domestic uh, factors. In other words, the balance of power regionally superseded the balance of power domestically. When you talk about a, a revolution from the grounds up, uh, usually would, one would hope it to be remain as to the net balance of the domestic configurations. <coughs> debates and arguments you know, in the shape of society, the economy, uh, conservative versus liberal, and so on and so forth. Uh, yet in the Arab cases, uh, with almost no exception, uh, that was all superseded 
uh, by the outside considerations of the neighboring countries, whether it's uh, uh, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, all began sh gradually but surely to insert their own interest, thus affecting and hijacking the domestic balance of, uh, of power inside the country. Uh, of course, uh, uh, here, I, I, one is correct to focus almost exclusively, uh, at least initially, on that domestic configuration in the case of Armenia, but one cannot rule out and uh, cannot have the luxury to rule out uh, the potential interferences uh, of neighboring countries in, or, or beyond that. For example, if you talk about uh, Russia, one could safely say that Russia had little impact on this bottom-up revolution or movement or what you want to call it. Uh, but uh, Russia might decide, if not others, to insert itself to co-write uh, the unfolding uh, story of the Armenian uh, book. And with that, I urge everybody, including this audience who is a participant uh, and a player for the unfolding Armenian story, to be vigilant uh, and to maintain the focus on the end result, the desired result, which is the creation of a responsible uh, polity, accountable government uh, that is first and foremost for the Armenian peoples wherever they are. Thank you. I'm going to turn next to Maria Karapetyan, who's joining us, um, I guess by Skype or <laughs> some technology that's beyond me, to describe <laughs> um, from Yerevan. And I'm going to ask you, I guess, a simple question. How does all this sound, these lessons, these priorities and pitfalls um, from Armenia right at this moment? Good evening, everybody, and well, good afternoon, everybody, and good evening to everybody who's watching us um, in Armenia right now. Um, well, actually, I think everything that, that's being discussed, that's being said, is very, very relevant um, for also the discussions that are taking place within Armenia today. Um, I think that whatever internally the, the Armenian society today is concentrating on is the expectations, the long-term expectations which is coming out of this process. And here probably the primary importance falls really onto uh, putting Armenia onto the path of democracy. As the Prime Minister has mentioned, truly preparing for the next elections and making sure that they do take place in a transparent and just manner is of utmost importance to the society right now. Um, but also, beyond this, there, is, there has been this lack of a sense of justice in society that needs to be restricted. Um, and here, probably, the spectrum is much bigger. Um, something needs to be done about the monopolies in the economy. Uh, something needs to be done. A lot of things need to be done about uh, corruption at different levels, from the state level, and descending all the way to the private elections. Um, and generally, a lot of things need to be put in place in order to avoid in Armenia in the same um, Also, the logistical changes that have taken place in Armenia in the recent years uh, are all questionable. They place in order to consolidate more and more power in the public parties and, and in particular in the leader, uh, even small changes all the way to the constitution are now being questioned. Uh, another important step that we have to take is to have um, open public dialogue regarding all the changes that are taking place in Armenia. How many of them will work? How many of them can be reversed? Or should we actually close taking into consideration whatever that has already been done a new page? Thank you. And let me thank also our participants for being so concise. It's going to give us some time for back and forth, which is wonderful. And our last initial statement from Dr. Pierce, um, and with your expertise in particular on political communications, communication technology, social media, what have we seen that's different in a you know, qualitative and quantitative way 
And what does that bode for the future? Again, in Armenia and throughout the Caucasus and other transition states. Sure, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about uh, some of the interesting things that happened with technology and social media during the protest events, but also um, looking forward in terms of how this might uh, extend that uh, the use of technology and social media in the governing um, as it's already existed and it will continue to exist in this transition time. So um, first I want to mention that um, it's very important for all of us that we do not give too much agency to technology. Uh, when people say things like the Facebook revolution or the Twitter, or the revolution will be tweeted, it makes me a little uncomfortable because the fact is, is that uh, political actions are taken by people and uh, it's, they are the important actors in them and that technology is merely helping to facilitate, amplify, extend uh, things that people can already do. Um, so I'd like you, when, uh, as I'm speaking, imagine uh, the same events that have been going on in Armenia for the last month and a half um, as if it was 20 years ago. Uh, I don't even want to say 10 years ago. In 2008, there certainly was a lot of technology being used in the events of that time. But even 20 years ago, what kind of differences existed? So the first point I want to make is that um, the organizers of civil disobedience and the protest were excellent at using social media for giving people instructions. So for example, tomorrow we're going to meet in this location at 1700. Uh, tomorrow I, we want you to do this and that. They were very clear instructions given via social media. And not only would that happen every evening at the rallies, but it could happen throughout the day um, if plans had changed. And so that sort of ability to convey information very quickly, if we were imagining this, you know, in our minds, this equivalent event 20 years ago, that just would not have been possible in the same way. And the organizers knew that and were very good at using this. In particular, I do want to draw attention to the fact that uh, Nicole himself uh, is masterful at his social media presentation. In particular, as we saw earlier, his one-on-one -on -one video communication. Uh, he has been doing this for years. He, uh, I don't want to somehow equate him to these kind of people, but he is as good as the best makeup vlogger, the best uh, social media influencers. He is really good at it. And in particular, uh, similar to uh, FDR in the US with his fireside chats, he does a really good job at engaging in what we as communication scholars call parasocial relationships. Uh, even in the reaction to him on the screen, I saw I feel this, you may feel this too, this sort of personal relationship with this man that uh, I doubt that many of us in this room, any of us in the live stream, or indeed Armenian citizens felt that kind of personal relationship with a politician before. And um, I think that this was key in his success. Uh, he's very charming, obviously, and he's very good at this. He looks you in the face, he smiles a lot, it really feels personal. Um, and that's been very important. Uh, I also want to draw attention to the fact that probably those of you in this room that haven't slept very well in a month know that the constant flow of information from our media, video live feeds, but also news reports coming at people that are not physically in Armenia and people that are in Armenia um, was an incredibly important way for information to be shared and also for people to uh, let their preferences be known. One of the difficulties in life, if we hold an opinion, we don't actually really know if other people share that opinion because people might not talk about it. But with social media, we get an immediate sense, you know, people changing their profile pictures, posting about things. We get a sense of how people are feeling. And so this was really important. Um, so that all happened during the protest events, but now we're entering the phase that there's actually governing to do. And as you might be aware, uh, Nicole continues to do uh, regular Facebook Live feeds, uh, although thankfully he's not doing them as often, probably better for him to actually do some work. Uh, so uh, he continues to report every day what he's doing and what he's planning to do. Uh, this is 
really interesting and a very different way of governing. And my hope is, is that this will help people continue to be engaged with what's going on and hopefully bring about some transparency. However, I'm not entirely certain that this is going to be sustainable for him or for citizens or for any of us. Although I really do want to know what is going on with that jackal, uh, it's, it's going to be difficult for all of us to continue to watch these feeds about what's going on in his life. Um, and I'm not really sure how that's going to intersect with other ways of governing. Um, I also fear that by doing much of this on Facebook as a platform, this is a proprietary platform, uh, it's not uh, a traditional media platform, that in a moment that could all be cut off if someone wanted to. Um, that relying on that particular source could lead to problems in the future. And then finally, I think that I'm really glad that social media has allowed everyone in this room, I imagine, a different way of engaging with the events in Armenia. But this too is a question of sustainability. Um, everybody needs to sleep a little more. Uh, our feeds are full of this information constantly. Where is this going to go for us uh, in the future is really important to think about and getting back to sort of normalcy while also keeping engaged in that particular way. Thank you. Let me pose one or two provocative questions to anyone who feels up to the challenge. Um, and the first is to ask about different constituencies in support of revolution, in support of major political change. Revolutions are usually made in the capital, in major urban centers. But revolutions often fail in the hinterland or in the provinces where often a majority of people live who have different needs, maybe a different socioeconomic situation, a different orientation to politics, European models, human rights, whatever it might be. And we've seen, maybe partially in the Georgian case, certainly in the Ukrainian case, that the euphoria of revolution was more the euphoria of, in perhaps the most admirable section of society, educated, liberal, desirous of a Western European kind of change, but they failed in good time to satisfy the demands, the needs, of the bulk of the population, which had often more basic bread and butter concerns, for whom, example, a new foreign investment regime brought no gain in the near term, or for whom certain priorities of, uh, let's say, law enforcement reform or uh, urban <coughs> renewal meant nothing. So my question is, those lessons, if you want to comment on them, and is Armenia at any risk for losing sight for the benefit of one part and the most active and admirable part of the population, if I can venture such a loaded phrase, to lose sight of the demands of another part of the population and, and what needs to be done to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, Anna, sure. I can take that. That's really an excellent question. Um, in terms of specific to Armenia, as I mentioned, the type of this particular transition that will determine its success, because it was so peaceful uh, as a movement, the, it was able to bring in many, many people from very diverse break, backgrounds. Um, uh, the movement cut across urban and rural divides, and that was very significant. Women were at the forefront. Youth uh, uh, was definitely in leadership position. So in terms of the representation, this was uh, definitely diverse. Um, but in terms of as to whether they will be satisfied, I'm a little bit worried that the expectations are sky high right now and a little bit of uh, echoing uh, uh, Kate a little bit here uh, the, uh, with the, whole, the, the streaming and the constant contact that is coming from Nicole Pashinyan, it's wonderful, but at the same time, it creates an expectation that a single individual will be able to solve these problems. There are a vast variety of problems and there are huge conversations that need to be happening as to whether um, uh, market reforms need to be continuing and if so, in what shape. And it's these types of policies that will affect 
effect, rural urban divide, but overall, again, looking at Latin American transitions, South European transitions, uh, poverty in general is a very significant risk factor for democratic consolidations. So I do not expect that one individual will be able to do that, uh, to address all of those issues. What I, am, uh, what I would hope uh, would happen is that the parliamentary system, the party politics will uh, become stronger. I think the parliament came out as a much stronger institution out of this transition. I think the split screens of people in the, in the squares watching the parliamentary sessions, that was a respect for the institutions no matter how flawed. And that really reflected the maturity of the Armenian population. Um, so those are some of the issues to take. But essentially, I guess, uh, uh, what I would, uh, where I would, when I would feel comfortable that Armenia has consolidated its democratic opening is when people make a connection between the pothole and the parliament, that they really have to work through the parliament to solve some of the very basic problems. And I'm... Oh. <laughs> I, and, and, any, any other quick additions to that? No, I want to involve I, everyone. I might add to that, too, that uh, one of the... the greatest strengths of this move movement is its early engagement with regions outside of the capital city. Uh, that was the one of the smartest things they could have done. And I absolutely agree with Anna that uh, the, the community of people engaged with the protests was very, very diverse. However, it is a challenge to know, um, and one of the problems also with those of us that get our information via social media is that we are missing out on those who are not. Sometimes it feels like a lot of Armenians are on Facebook, and it's true but we're missing out on people, and it's not randomly distributed, elderly, poor, rural, uh, disenfranchised, and how do those people feel? Uh, Nicole's yet so far been very smart about his communication strategy being very plain spoken, very clear, very direct. If I was making decisions though, I would try as hard as I can to be after uh, moving past the free and fair election issue, to get on issues that are going to touch the widest variety of people. I think it was very wise of him to say to uh, parents of soldiers, stop sending your son's uh, goods. The government, the army should be delivering these goods. That's something that touches everyone. Healthcare, education, if they can early on address things that are going to reach a broader spectrum of the society, that would be very wise for being inclusive and remaining, uh, get, remaining the support of those kind of people. David, well, yes, add to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is uh, actually about the most fundamental problem our countries face there. And it is, uh, just imagine traveling from Tbilisi Center to Erevan Center and crossing these towns and villages. What is the picture? You start from here, go down, 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 down until you reach the border. You continue down, 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 and then and go up. Of course, I didn't really see, but... <laughs> Meaning, the country is not the same country. The people live in so different circumstances and conditions that the common future is, the understanding of the common future is very low. Because when you travel through the more or less developed country, you see same America, same Germany. There are differences. But what are the differences in our countries? That's why we, we need to understand how differently those people are understanding all the things. How differently they are digesting what has happened. What are their expectations and so on. And that's where we are coming to the, that key point. How to make from that, this population the entity of the citizens who have the common future. Because what unites these people is common homeland, common history, but not the common future. And this common future is called modern state. And we failed so far in our region, our countries, to build modern state in our homelands, which would take care of these kind of issues, inequality, uh, equal distribution of resources, responsibilities, and so on. For that, the new government, probably needs to introduce very urgent measures. And those measures sometimes are not popular. And sometimes people think, what's the, what's the relevance, for example, changing the system of administration of the income taxes 
to the issues what people now expect. But there is, in, in, in fact, huge relevance. Just ask every Jama Armenian citizen how much uh, he or she earns. The answer would be the amount which comes to the pocket. The other money which was taken as income taxes is not considered as my money, which I earned and gave to the government. Yeah. That money is considered as government's money, and if something comes to me, just a small portion, I'm already so grateful. So this must be changed. If the administra administration of income taxes would allow a person first get the whole income and then pay this 20 or 26 or whatever percent to the government, then that person would be attached to the government. Then no Ser Sargisian or David Supashvili or Nikol Fashinian or whoever could be able to last so long without addressing the needs of those people, without explaining why this is happening or why that's not this happening. This is a very urgent thing because creation of modern state in our countries became a huge problem. We thought that our great history of statehood would be kind of positive side in our attempts to build a new modern state. It appears that it's not positive side so far. We live in our history, we bring some great stories from those great uh, past, and we fail to do very simple things which are necessary now. So that would make the citizens involved, engaged, and becoming owners of their country. Fires, your follow-up okay. yeah, as well. Briefly, the experiences in the Arab cases uh, bring one dimension, I think, needs, that needs to be kept in mind. It's, uh, it, the initial phase, which is not as, uh, which, is, which had enjoyed uh, the same level of excitement and if not euphoria, that there was a, a great deal of underestimation and exaggeration. Uh, and uh, as such, one way to avoid uh, such uh, uh, you know, sentiment is to begin delinking uh, uh, the democratic devel development uh, and that it is going to produce some economic miracle all, of, all overnight. Uh, that extremely will disappoint lots of people big time. Uh, I think the challenge is to uh, yeah, sure the government needs to deliver uh, and if it does not, there should be a mechanism in place for it to be thrown out of the office in a democratic fashion. Uh, and as such, uh, the, the idea is uh, through the process to uh, get on board as many uh, actors as possible where all agree that democracy is the only game in town. And that actually will be a huge success without paying attention, or rather without you know, linking the two together so as to disappoint people and then become disengaging people going back to the old uh, regime type of days. Thank you. We have exactly one minute left, so okay. any following comment has to be very short. What is the biggest foreign threat to Armenia's transition? People have been amazed at how smoothly things have gone with Russia. What about hmm. Azerbaijan? In what ways could the Karabakh conflict derail what's underway? Any thought to that, just in a nutshell? In well, with, with one sentence, there is no threat from Georgia. That's what <laughs> I can <assure. laughs> With that, unfortunately, I have to call a close to this first session. <laughs> Join me once more. Thank our panelists. <laughs>
What we want to show you now are three videos. The first, and all very brief, the first one is a timeline, a timeline for April. The second and third are very quick talks with two very important economists. Daron Ajemolu, who is at MIT, whose book Why Nations Fail stresses the importance of institutions for both economic and political development. And Pedros Terzian, who heads an operation, a large one called Petro Strategy. He's an oil and gas and energy consultant. And both of them are talking about Armenia's economy, prospects, needs, urgencies. Daron addresses questions of kleptocracies that must transform. Bedros talks about how do you achieve political, economic independence if you're Armenia in the region in which you're at. So please take a look at the videos and we will follow with Professor Dan Mazmanian and four of our guests. Thank you.
Professor Ajemolu, thank you very much for giving us the time. Thanks, you. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm very sorry you're not here, but hopefully next time. I hope so. Tell me, please, the one fundamental question that I think we're all wondering about is, if what we've had thus far has been more or less a kleptocracy, where it was okay to do with the resources of the country as the ruling elite wished, wisely or unwisely, how do we get from that point to an even playing field? I think that's the great question of the day, and it's not just for Armenia, for many countries. I think there is very little doubt that, broadly speaking, Armenia has been under a kleptocracy for the last two decades or even more, and uh, it's wonderful that there is a turning point or a potential turning point. But unfortunately, there is no blueprint for any country to follow closely and make sure that they get out of kleptocracy. The way I would like to think about it is that such a change has two legs. And the first leg is that you need a peaceful political transition, meaning that you actually require that there is the beginning of a process of political change and that this doesn't spin out of control and turn into a huge civil war or a mortal combat between different factions. And Armenia miraculously perhaps managed that. We are in the midst of a process of political change. At least temporarily, the old guard are out. Uh, new faces, new blood, new perspectives are here. And more importantly, there is a, a broad enthusiasm in society, civil society, government, business, diaspora, all that we need change, and this is the right time for it. So this is just an amazingly fortuitous set of conditions for us to get going. But the second leg of this process is no easier. And that's how do you actually make sure that you start changing the fund fundamental features of a kleptocratic extractive system and create one where in which there is a level playing field, there are incentives, there are opportunities, and people are encouraged to uh, participate productively in the economic and social environment of the country. It, we know that it requires us to get rid of the corrupt elite. It requires us to bring new institutional elements so that the, uh, the, the new system doesn't turn into one in which other individuals, other groups become the beneficiaries of corruption. How do you stop that? Well, the way to stop that, you know, of course, uh, having people who refuse to be corrupt is one element of this, but it's much more than that. You really require the institutional foundations of it, both politically and economically. You need a much better judiciary. You need to improve the way that you regulate the economy. You tax the economy. You create incentives for businesses. Very, very importantly for Armenia, you need to keep on building human capital. I think those principles include, first of all, exploit the good beginning that we've had, which means that instead of trying to sort of find ways of punishing your opponents or even punishing the, the people who were corrupt previously, just look into the future. The, the point is not to get revenge against opponents or anything like that, but to to found the institutional backbone so that the same things don't happen again. And this applies not just to the political realm, it applies to the judiciary, to the bureaucracy. You know, one of the reasons why, how could Armenia be so kleptocratic for so long? Well, one answer, the judiciary did not work. A country with an independent judiciary, uh, judges and prosecutors who are honest and dedicated to their work and are not influenced and manipulated by politicians would not have stood by. So that means that judiciary needs fundamental reform. But that doesn't mean that you have to fire everybody. You have to change the rules of the game. You have to uh, encourage retirements, perhaps, so that the worst offenders uh, who are political appointees and who are not up to the job are uh, retire with their pensions or whatever. But new blood comes in. That can't happen very quickly. And that's the real... Uh, uh, real dilemma here because, you know, you cannot fire 
5,000 judges and the prosecutors and uh, bring new ones because the human capital is not there. So you have to do this slowly. You have to start cultivating the human capital. But the enthusiasm is there, both abroad and, and at home. But that's just one of the dimensions. The other ones uh, all have their own character. But what's common among them is that you have to, again, uh, grab this opportunity and build the institutional foundations. You know, we have a inspiring prime minister but the worst thing that Armenia can do is, you know, create uh, no institutionalized structure for the leader, for the executive, uh, whoever that is, to govern. So the way to deal with, the, with, with change is not to say we have to do the change, whatever the cost. We have to, the, the way to tackle this change is to create the institutional foundations, create political organizations, parties, uh, civil society organizations that are going to get involved in politics. That's great because Armenian society is mobilized. Armenian society is excited. Armenian youth is excited. Those are just the right times to start creating these institutions. Thank you. The news is that you will be also on the record, off the record, advising the Armenian government. Is that true? Well, I would be very happy to do whatever I can, because this is a historic opportunity for Armenia. It's really something that we've all wanted to see. And there, I cannot imagine a better beginning as the first chapter of a new era. But what I just answered in response to your question also says that what I can do is is only advisory and limited because there is no blueprint. If this was like building a dam or a bridge, you know, I could draw the blueprints and say, this is how you should do it. This is how you stress the, the stress test the dam. You should use steel, not this. Uh, and, and that's it. That's the blueprint. Unfortunately, social change doesn't work that way. Unless you understand the real details of uh, the, the conflicts within society, the personalities, the, uh, the fault lines of where the institutions, regulation, corruption, vote buying, patronage, uh, exploitation, media manipulation, all of these, how they work, unless you understand them. And an outsider like me, you know, uh, whatever you do, you're just not going to be able to understand them very well. Unless you understand them, you cannot come up with the right compromises and the right uh, uh, strategies and tactics for dealing with the process of institutional change. I am happy to share what I know because this is an exciting time. This is uh, the least I can do. But I think at the end of the day, you know, who has to step up? The Armenian people, not the prime minister, not the MPs, not the bureaucrats, not the judges, certainly not me and not the diaspora. It's the Armenian people, the youth, the people who have been silent and sidelined for so long. They are becoming involved in politics. They have to find a way of remaining engaged and turning this into a positive process of change. And I don't mean by that that people should be, uh, you know, uh, protesting every day, but they should be engaged. They should refuse the compromises uh, and, uh, and, and the mistakes that were made for the last two and a half, three decades, and, uh, and continue to provide their support to whoever is undertaking meaningful reform and keep their vigilance so that a new corrupt uh, kleptocratic group doesn't come in place. They should uh, form through media, through non-governmental organizations, civil society, the right way of monitoring the process so that it's not the old guard, it's not incompetence, but, but positive change that's, uh, that's ongoing. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your thoughts. And I am sure we will be hearing from you again and frequently. And that's a good thing. Thank, thank you, Safi. Thank you. Mr. Terzian, thank you for joining us. I'm going to ask you one of the questions that is uh, possibly the fundamental question when we're talking about future political and economic development, and that is the issue of energy, because it has both security implications as well as economic implications, obviously. You're the expert in the field. What is it the Armenian government needs to be thinking about as it thinks about future development? Energy is uh, the central pillar of an economy. At the same time, it's an important element of political independence. Now, if we take the case of Armenia, which is a landlocked country with hostile neighbors, uh, with Azerbaijan and Turkey, 
uh, we must uh, uh, design and uh, imagine an energy system which must be at the same time independent, local, clean, and as cheap and low cost as possible. The present system is mostly based on uh, nuclear power. We have an old plant and the government plans to use it up to 2027, which is really a maximum limit. Now, uh, as far as I know, uh, there are no alternatives to, and we are late because uh, we don't have enough time. The other part of the system is based on hydropower and uh, natural gas powered uh, plants. Now, uh, what needs to be done is to make most of solar and wind potential in Armenia. We have a lot of wind potential and solar potential. We of these two, we can uh, make an, uh, the needed energy uh, uh, for the power, nuclear power plant. Uh, we don't need any more than nuclear power plant if we develop the solar and the wind energy at their maximum levels. At the same time, we can double production of hydroelectricity and use water more efficiently. There is a lot of waste in Armenia. Why? Because in Soviet era, when there was a problem, the solution was always supply side solution, not uh, efficiency side solutions. So if you have water needs, you add new supply. You don't uh, think about how can I use my water resources in a better way. Now this must change. We have a lot of water resources and we can make a lot in power production and for irrigation. You know, and we need, and we need finally uh, some natural gas powered uh, uh, plants because of balancing. So we still need natural gas, but um, the main source of energy must be and can be solar energy, wind, and hydro. You know, what you're saying mirrors what environmental activists in Armenia have been saying over the last five, six, eight years. And I repeated what you just said to a friend the other day. And he said, is it possible that Armenia, in fact, has enough that it can, in fact, rely just on those two sources, hydro and solar? Is that a realistic yes. goal? Yes, it is realistic. In addition to natural gas, as I said, uh, because of balancing needs, Natural gas uh, will be used as a swing producer for electricity. But the main sources can be and must be hydropower and solar and wind. We have a lot of potential in solar and wind. Now, the other advantage of investing in solar and wind is that this is very flexible investment. It can be very small investments, starting with only $1,000 for an individual house, going up to 100 million, 150 million, whatever it is, for large uh, solar plants producing electricity. So uh, it gives also flexibility and it gives independence. This is an independent, clean energy source. Is so, this being uh, done anywhere in Armenia? Not yet on a large scale. Uh, uh, the law on renewable energies was only voted two years ago. We are very late at least 10, 15 years late on, on that. But it can be done. If we put a lot of efforts on that, it can be done. Uh, 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 I think that if we r really put everything needed in that field, we can avoid having to build a new nuclear power plant. Nuclear is a past energy. And in addition, it's a very costly now, if you want to build a nuclear power plant, the, we need six to seven billion dollar investment, even in a, a small size or middle sized plant. This means we will almost double external debt of Armenia. The Armenia economy cannot support that. Great. Thank you very much. When you plan a program in two weeks, you work with the schedule of the experts you have. And 
Both of them were very willing to do this, but were unable to do it by Skype. So we're grateful to both Daron Lajemolu and Bedros Terzian for being with us. I'm going to um, introduce Professor Dan Mazmanian and the next panel, Edward Muradian, Grigor Atanesian, and Emil Sanamian. When I said we're very grateful to be in a university with a lot of really good friends across campus, Dan Mazmanian is one of them. He's a member of our academic council. He used to be dean of the policy school. So you can't get better than getting the former dean of the policy school to talk about policy and what happens next, what comes for, to us now, what do we do? Participating with him are Edward Muradian, uh, someone very familiar with Armenia's judicial system, Grigor Atanesian, who's at the University of Missouri. He's uh, originally from Russia and studying a Fulbright scholar in the journalism school. And Emil Sanamian, who knows as much about the region and military and strategic initiatives and history as he does about Armenia's internal politics. We're very grateful to have them all. Following this panel will be the message from President Sarkisian. So in this panel, we have the pleasure of looking ahead. It is time the program where we ask ourselves these broad questions about moving forward. And there are really two momentous issues, it seems to me, that are central to Armenia's what's being called Second Velvet Revolution. And they'll be the focus of our discussion in just a moment. First, the first question is, will it endure? What are the, what are the change, what changes are required in the economic, the political, the civic, the cultural life of Armenia? Second, what role can and should the Armenians living abroad be playing in this transition? We have a panel, as, as indicated, of four well-informed and insightful speakers who've been introduced, so let's begin. Edward, share your thinking on the importance of the rule of law and the judiciary in a democratic society and a thriving economy. Thank you, Dan, this is a, this is a interesting and global question, rule of law in a, the role of rule of law in developing democratic society. Uh, I can speak about this for hours and at the same time uh, the answer is simple. It is impossible to go ahead and have sustainable de development without rule of law because after all, as the Prime Minister just mentioned, we are in, in a uh, quest for just Armenia, for just government. And as you know, governments usually are not just, especially the executive that has a very specific agenda and often considers that all means are good in achieving this agenda, objectively. They're not to be blamed because they have to deliver specific actions, specific reforms, uh, specific results, and all, all means are good. Whatever you do, just achieve there, just deliver, just show your constituency that you delivered. And there needs to be a system of checks and balances, which we all know very well about, and, and everybody in Armenia knows very well about that, but it is having that system work and actually balance off the executive, uh, put restraints on the executive, but restraints that would not frustrate any policy, but vice versa, enable the policy. <clears throat> um, I've recently listened to a lot of interviews and, and opinions and on, on how to proceed with the reforms and how to make, make this process, this exciting, really, uh, exciting process of uh, changes that all of a sudden came after this stagnant environment dominated in Armenia for uh, over, over a decade. Uh, and all of a sudden this fresh air comes in and people stand up against uh, ineffective government, should we call it, unjust, injustice, should we call it. Uh, and changes are imminent. They're, they're 
they, they come a, 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 around in the words of the prime minister, members of his ca cabinet announcing, I, I, turn off, I turn on my Facebook and I see the prime minister saying, you know, influencing the courts is not something I'm going to do. It's a red line for me. I'm not going to cross it. And the message was that the courts are in a, in a deadlock. They have to pass important political decisions, and they seem to be uh, unable uh, to determine what they should decide because they've been influenced constantly uh, by the executive who decided what the outcome of at least the most important cases should be. And, and now these impulses, the signals, these instructions are not being channeled to the judiciary properly. And, uh, and, and judges may be lost. That's a very possible situation. At least that's what the prime minister reported in his live stream. Uh, and the message to the courts was, no, we're not going to give you more instructions. We, we, we are immediately transitioning to a situation of rule of law, of independent courts. Well, is that enough for the courts to become independent? Is it enough uh, for the leadership of the country to convey the message that from this point on, courts are independent, we're not going to influence your decisions, go ahead and decide whatever you feel like? Would, is that enough? Uh, let me bring up a, a simple matter to be a little bit more specific, because everything I say is going to be very general. Uh, there, there is a notion of responsibility of a judge for the decision that he makes. And this, uh, this responsibility, uh, uh, the, the legal, the statutory uh, expression of this responsibility has been discussed at length. And many, many politicians felt that the judges should be responsible for the decisions they make. Isn't that right? Wouldn't you agree? I mean, we give the judges so much power to decide whatever they want. We give them only one standard, base it on the law and your you know, sincere belief. Okay. Should the judges be responsible for the decisions they make? Should they? No. Anybody thinks judges should be responsible for the decisions they make? Of course, yes, or of course, no. Who, who is? Yes. Who is yes? The right answer is yes. <laughs> and, and who is no? Well, see, the, I, my conclusion, I don't know if I'm wrong, please correct me, Dan, Dan, but my conclusion is that most of the active audience thinks the judges should be responsible for the decisions they make. Well, guess what? You just eliminated independence of the court because you just said that the judge shall make a decision but there will be someone who is able to call the judge to account for that decision. And we're not speaking of the superior court that will not hold the judge accountable. He will just correct the mistake the judge committed. Okay? So the, the same matter was discussed in Armenia and was decided that yes, judges should be responsible for their decisions. With that responsibility, we have Ministry of Justice, Judicial Council, now the Supreme Judicial Council, enabled to call a judge to a responsibility for the decision he entered in due process if he breached the law in his decision. And if you ask any U.S. lawyer or any U.S. judge, whether he would be, whether the judge should be responsible for a decision, it goes with big red letters. The judge is not responsible for the decision he makes. No one can hold the judge responsible for the judicial act that he makes because that's what the principle of independence of the court is based. The judge, the only, the, the most important obligation of the judge is to secure due process, parties' abilities to submit their case, argue it, and then he enters the decision. But once you make him accountable for the decision to any other official, 
Where is independence? I mean, this can go for hours. I, I like realize there, we, we, we've been working on the judicial reform in Armenia for 15 years in different stages. I was lucky to participate in one of the stage, an exciting experience for me as a, as a uh, newly appointed judge and uh, 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 this reform resulted in major changes in the judiciary. And I hope this process now with healthier political environment, which I hope will be established after, after the uh, new elections uh, at the parliament, I hope this will really bring us to having stronger and more independent judiciary um, and, and, and allow the dream of having just Armenia. So on for, that... for sake of fairness, I should say that everything that has done till now, or most of what has done, been done till now, uh, was in, in general, m most of it were positive developments. They did not render the results for one simple reason. There was no political will of having independent courts. Yesterday, after seeing the Prime Minister's live stream, I, I put aside my speech that I prepared for today, and I'm here to tell you there is a political will in Armenia to have independent courts, because the only official that is elected by the people, the leader elected by the people, tells us, we want independent courts. What can be more important? Now, what we got to make sure is this becomes a sustainable will. Which, which goes actually to the purpose of raising this issue, as well as the others, which is what issues are so critical to the sustaining democratic society that people are wishing for. And, and I know we could spend the rest of the afternoon on just this one, but we're gonna move on. So Grigor, how important, how important is public accountability? And in this context, free media as a back, back, backbone to a real democratic society. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, one of the most important consequences of this Armenian revolution is the heightened interest of uh, both Armenians in Armenia and the Armenian diaspora, Armenian communities all over the world, to politics. And I was preoccupied with this question, what is a journalist I and we as journalists can do to sort of sustain this interest to address this uh, new demand, adequately address it, and keep those in power accountable. And I was thinking of this line which comes from the um, ethics code of the Society of the Professional Journalists, and it goes like, for our journalism and for our democracy to re reach full potential, it's crucial to have uh, to have a robust supply of reliable information about key issues and it must be made accessible for all. And I was thinking, now what does that mean? It basically means that we all have to know a lot of stuff about what is going on in, on all levels of our governance. And how do we do that? How is a journalist uh, I can do that. Well, you know, there are tools which we rarely discuss, but they do exist in Armenia. For example, Armenia has a freedom of information law, which was adopted some 15 years ago. And it was never fully implemented, but it's a great law which actually requires public officials to disclose, especially when requested by journalists, a whole bunch of information about who they hire, how they hire, how do they spend money, uh, and so on and so forth. It's a bit of outdated law because it was adopted 15 years ago. It perhaps can be amended, but even the enforcement of this law would change drastically the whole picture and, uh, I guess, political life of the country. And we as journalists, we should be pushing for and using those instruments we'll, that we already have. And uh, it will take, frankly, for the journalism and for the democracy to function to establish and develop institutional transparency, and of course, it should be the journalists who must be pushing for it. The new government, as of now, appears to be very uh, sympathetic to the idea of transparency, and during the whole transition period, you perhaps all noticed how Nikol Pashinyan was insisting on meetings and negotiations only in front of cameras, only in the presence of 
of the media. And uh, now he does this Facebook Live videos, even chasing a coyote. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's, it's something, they are more open than the previous government has ever been. But it should be the media, it should be the media community which is pushing for the institutional framework for this uh, transparency. Because, you know, it's good to know what is going on in the residence of Prime Minister, but it's also good to know who he meets every day, right? To have his calendar, to have his meeting schedule, to have... Uh, to get access to his correspondence, as for example, you have in the US, you can demand, you can request the correspondence of any public official, and if it's not classified, you will be granted access to it under the Freedom of Information Law uh, for yeah, the American one, which was, of course, the model for the uh, Armenian legislation. And for example, you, you all know, you all perhaps heard the story about the uh, EPA chief Scott Pruitt, who uh, flew only uh, business class and had this uh, crazy amounts of money spent on security personnel and he was justifying it because, by saying that he's receiving death threats. And then media, using this freedom of information law uh, request, uh, they actually requested from the EPA any letters that he received of death threats. And the EPA officially, officially uh, reported that he received none. And it was only his desire to fly first class that uh, made him do that. So I, I want to see this kind of stuff in Armenia. I want to know what's going on with our, to say, environment protection minister, ministry. You know, there is a lot of very concerning projects going on, mines, uh, many, eco um, many activists are very concerned about uh, impact on, on the ecology and the environment of Armenia. So we need, we need to have instruments like that in place. Uh, but also, that's, that's all good. We have demand stuff from government. But as journalists, we also have to think what we are doing wrong and what we perhaps can reevaluate in terms of our practices, standards, and ethics. And there is a couple of issues which I feel like it's high time to deal with. And uh, first of all, perhaps it's the tendency uh, to sort of personify and uh, person uh, tendency of sens sensationalism in the media. When we cover news events as, you know, X versus Y as, as a story of stuff being said by the most famous or infamous people in our country, as opposed to system, systemic problems, which we, we, for example, we can be talking about whatever stuff Gagik Tsarukyan or Samvel Aleksanyan says, and we can di be discussing that all day, every day, and putting it in our headlines, or we can talk why we don't still have a professional legislature, why we have those oligarch MPs, what, you know, what laws should be implemented, should be adopted, should be written uh, to finally draw a red line between special interests and public service and stuff like that. So, uh, but also, uh, what is perhaps even more crucial right now, there is also one, and no, no doubt that's a global trend, but we can also see it in Armenian newsrooms, tendency to focus on negative events. And I think it's particularly dangerous right now because we have this, and everybody mentioned that, we have this... Uh, unexpected, tremendous citizens' participation in Armenian politics, and Armenian newsrooms have to behave in the way that won't endanger it. Because if we keep focusing on negative events, not community building, you know, not citizen participation, but just whatever bad stuff which is going on, we are risking sort of uh, making people go back to the, this old narrative of, you know, politics as a field which is owned by rock actors. And, you know, if you're an honest person, you have nothing to do with politics. It's too depressing. It's always too dark. And, you know, you better stay in your own private life, develop your own private interest, and never enter this public space. So this is, these are my main concerns for well, now. Well, Grigor, you, you have now given us a second huge challenge, but once again looking forward, which is this whole issue of accountability and the role of the media. Uh, these are generic problems or generic issues, as well as the courts that all societies face, but Armenia is facing them very directly right now. And I want to turn to a third area, an arena, who's, who's joining us by Skype. 
What, what, are the, what are a few of the critical changes needed in Armenia's state institutions to better serve the people in this, I will call it, post, post-Soviet Armenia? Professor Mazmania, thank you so much. Well, um, first of all, let's be clear that uh, institutions do not deliberately fail. Institutions are managed and run by people. So it is the political leadership who was in charge of the state institutions in Armenia that has failed its citizens. There are very few state institutions in Armenia that we could confidently say are established bodies, have institutional memory, can sustain political power changes, and can function as real institutions with internal checks and balances, as opposed to stiff vertical power structures something that we actually had seen for many years in Armenia, especially in areas uh, such as justice or the court system. So in addition to that, because state institutions in Armenia have had such weak institutional structures, the real role of the political leadership in charge of these institutions was ever more prominent. So I want to address the elephant in the room and that the political leadership in charge of Armenia and the country state institutions was the Republican Party of Armenia, uh, who has been in power for now more than 10 years uh, since their um, victory in the election seven. Now, naturally, for any political party, one of the key objectives is attaining political power. However, for the Republican Party, holding on to power became an end in itself. From one election to another, the election fraud became more sophisticated. If 10 years ago the RPA would stuff ballot boxes under a gunpoint, in the most recent election, widespread vote buying was what brought them uh, the majority parliament. Election fraud had systematically alienated the citizens of Armenia. Their vote did not count. It was not important as a political agency. They, we, were reduced to nothing. So the civil society continued to be weak and people continued to vote with their feet, leaving Armenia. Under Republican parties and their Sarksan's leadership, Armenia lost close to 370,000 people to Exodus. As election was built, so were other institutions. Given the time constraint, emphasize two areas in particular, also echoing what Sir Darren Achamoglu said earlier. First is the justice system. The tradition in Armenia under leadership became a tool of political power preservation and perpetuation. From political prisoners, non-prosecution of elect, uh, elect, election fraud, I'm sorry, uh, from non-prosecution of the workers of March 1st, 2008, to the punitive views of the it is important to note that much of those people who left Armenia over the past decade were not only those that are jobs and financial stability or financial success, but more importantly, those who sought social justice and institutional justice. Another sector that is absolutely worth mentioning is governance. I would like to specifically outline the fiscal governance. From municipal budget and road construction, the military supply of basic for the conscripts in the Armenian military, those in charge ones would operate on kickback under the table dealing. Professor Mazmanian, and the second part of the question was about what changes are needed in going forward. Let me start here as well. One of the first things I believe that this new government needs to implement are forensic audits. Of, without exception, all state institutions and government-funded projects and endowments in the country. This is absolutely necessary to, first of all, assess the damage of poor governance, hold those accountable, and reevaluate state spending. This is also, um, and more importantly, an effective exercise in establishing a much-needed trust between the state institutions and the taxpayers. We haven't had a chance to talk about the economy, but by various accounts, the shadow economy is about $4 billion. So this new government will have the chance to bring a substantial part of it into the formal economy. I know I'm running out of 
time here. So let me just uh, conclude here by adding that one of the most important changes that are needed and that this new government has already started is transparency and accountability of governance and equally important is inclusiveness. The previous government created this huge gap between the people and the state. There were two parallel realities with the state and its media delivering news in the Soviet style propaganda reporting uh, that all is a okay and the government is doing a stellar job. And the other reality was and is continued demogra demographic crisis, poverty, unemployment, economic stagnation, and ever growing and looming external state budget. Now, the Velvet Revolution was the most effective exercise in bridging that gap, make, making people more inclusive and participatory in the political processes. May 1st alone was historic because every Armenian was glued to his or her mobile device for close to 10 hours listening to the political Q&A on the floor in the parliament. That's more than an average American's viewing time of C-SPAN in his or her entire life. And let me uh, end here on this positive note. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so Mil, you've been listening all day and, and have been watching this very closely yourself. And, and I want to just ask you in the context of kind of wrapping up this conversation is, is based on all the things we've been hearing, what are some analogies or some of the lessons learned elsewhere in the region about these very same issues? Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to try to be a little entertaining uh, considering I'm the last here, and uh, this is still sort of the tail end of the celebrations that we saw on April 23rd, that we uh, saw on May 8th. Uh, what were we exactly celebrating, um, whether that people in Armenia or us here, sort of with our uh, uh, gaze towards Armenia, permanent attention towards Armenia, sort of this big fan group of Armenia that we are in uh, in the United States and elsewhere. I think one fundamental thing that we were celebrating in that, is that finally, <clears throat> after 30 years, Armenian citizens were able to coalesce, create a critical mass, and exercise their power to get a uh, 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 leader of the country to resign and to hand power to uh, uh, an opposition candidate. This has not happened in, uh, in uh, Armenia's history prior to this, in independent Armenian history, ever before. And uh, this is something that was not created over a two-week period. It was not created over uh, this uh, march that uh, Nikol Pashinyan did from uh, Gyumri to Yerevan. It was created through this very little uh, and uh, some of the uh, bigger streams of uh, erosion of this uh, 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 monopoly on power that was occurring in Armenia over the past decades, right? Uh, I think uh, part of this institution is part of that effort to erode that uh, monopoly on power through uh, supporting uh, critical research, supporting uh, independent media like uh, uh, Salpi was involved in with CivilNet. All of that work had finally borne this fruit. Now that it has uh, fruit has been born, what do we really have now today with this new Armenia we didn't have before? Well, I think. Number one the we, uh, issue that we uh, are enjoying here is this new sense of buy-in into the government and into the country that people did not have before. The excuses that used to be used, oh, this, is, this government cannot be changed, the elections are always fixed, uh, the, uh, uh, I cannot express my opinion about this or that, I cannot run my business because of uh, tax in inspections, etc. Those uh, excuses right now have, are, are beginning to fade. Uh, of course, uh, that does not translate immediately into uh, a success, as we already heard about uh, Georgia, we heard about uh, Ukraine. We've had experiences where there's been this moments of uh, 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 victory, popular victory, that did not translate into, into long-term successful outcomes. I think what the, um, the slow progress is the progress that sticks. Uh, I think what... Uh, my personal uh, expectation would be for this slow and steady progress uh, to bring Armenia to a qualitatively new place where, uh, to, towards the time when Nikol Pashinyan has that exit moment, when he is thrown out of the government, not hopefully through popular uprising, but through uh, the election. Because that moment has to happen in the future for Armenia to have a successful system where you have a change of government and when you have, where you have checks and balances. If we look at this last 10 years of Armenia's history under Sir Sarkisyan, 
we've, we can complain about uh, different uh, negative phenomena that w was occurring in Armenia and we were, were all aware of, but one thing that was also occurring in Armenia is that Armenian media has become freer, much freer than anywhere in that part of the world with the exception of Georgia. We've uh, had much more tolerance towards protests that we did not have. All of those things came together to make this moment possible. And hopefully this new government will be able to add to this um, progress that has been made to make Armenia uh, uh, much more of a, a successful enterprise for all of its uh, citizens. Uh, looking at what is happening around the world, uh, in, in Armenia still and around the world, there is a concern that Armenia is essentially surrounded, if you look at what happened in Armenia as a revolution, by counter-revolutionary powers. Governments that have, over the past decade and decades, have moved away from the more participatory systems to less participatory and more restricted systems. Look at Turkey, where there's virtually no free media left, where the uh, president's concentrating power. Look at Iran, where there have been efforts to, uh, to modernize the country and to engage with the world, but on the one hand, you have the conservative uh, people, the Rahbar, the, the, uh, the uh, supreme leader who still controls, uh, has an uh, indefinite role, and you have the United States uh, renewing pressure on uh, the reformist side of Iran. And of course, look at Azerbaijan and look at Russia, where you have basically presidents for life at this point. Um, there is a concern that, you know, the, the, this country, at least especially uh, you know, Russia and Azerbaijan, might not be uh, too uh, excited about Armenia's success as a democracy, or Armenia's success as a, as a more, uh, of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, forward-moving country. We have to be mindful of that. We have to find, uh, Armenian government has to find ways to, to address these concerns. And uh, hopefully they will find a way, as I've uh, seen uh, in, over the past couple of weeks with the first meetings, international meetings that uh, Mr. Pashinyan had. One more point I wanted to say about the success of Armenia so far is the success of Armenian institutions, which uh, Mr. Pashinyan also uh, acknowledged. Uh, most importantly, the military. The fact that the military stayed neutral in all this process was a very, very significant event for Armenia. Uh, the fact that we have a foreign ministry, even though many people, are, you know, I was a big critic of the foreign, foreign, foreign minister, but we had a foreign ministry with a lot of dedicated diplomats and a lot of experienced staff, so now that Nikol Pashinyan was elected prime minister, all it took for him is to take the plane and go to Sochi and be briefed on what is it that we have on Armenian-Russian agenda right now, or Armenian-Kyrgyzstan uh, agenda, or Tajikistan agenda, that we can, you know, discuss with this, uh, with, with, with this countries. And it's not, he's not starting from the blank slate. And uh, even uh, the, the, you know, the less sort of the, the glorified or the less uh, publicized uh, aspects of the Armenian institutions, the continued institutions that continue to work throughout this protest period. Thank you very much. Of, of course, I knew when, when we came out that we were not going to have time to digest and, and discuss all of these issues. I was hoping we could get on to even more, but as I looked up, our time is out. So, so, so I think on this note, on this note, which is actually quite positive about how Armenia is not like the countries that surround it in the region, and we do have hope in both changing our law, engaging our media, reform our institutions, and being aware of our special place, I think we need to thank the panel very much. Thank you all. Thank you. And finally, His Excellency, Mr. Armen Sarkisian, the President of Armenia. What are the biggest opportunities that you need to change the government office? Well, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I would like to address the, the audience, which is the University of South California, and I hope not only, all universities in California, United States, and worldwide. So basically, I would like to address the younger generation, the next generation of Armenians worldwide. The opportunities that this uh, movement, the Velvet Revolution, uh, called, which was the name that was used here in Armenia, I would call 
revolution Armenian style, which could be a trademark worldwide, the way that in the 21st century you can change, change the regime or political system by, through peaceful demonstrations and exp expression of your position and, and your beliefs. I think this, it's unique, it's wonderful, and it's uh, also very important. And I think we as Armenians could be proud of what we have achieved during the uh, April, May of 2018. And of course, that creates huge uh, expectations worldwide amongst Armenians, especially among the younger generation. Because that, first of all, makes Armenians, especially the younger ones, to feel again that they are the owners of this country. They are the owners of the values. They are the owners of the heritage. They are the owners of the future of this country. And the second time, it's very important that, and the second, that it's very important that uh, that feeling of being a citizen, i.e., uh, being the responsible for the future, is there. When I was offered to become president, I was thinking that I will have seven years of through ev evolution and um, discussions, express, uh, expression of your personal opinion or encouraging people to again become a citizen. Be free to express your opinion and stand by to your opinion, what you believe on, and also be a good citizen when you go to the election poll. Be honest and responsible. But instead of seven years, it happens in seven days. <laughs> The opportunities are huge because we are, first of all, to use the, the fact that I call that we are a, a small state but a global nation. There are four or five times probably more Armenians living abroad than in Armenia today. A lot of them are very good citizens of the countries that they are living today. There are, some of them are highly recognized by international community as professionals, successful businessmen, scientists, politicians, and etc. And most of them are uh, highly respectful, honest people. So it's the time that everybody recognizes that Armenia, their homeland, is really their homeland. And they belong to this state and they belong to this great nation. And to, the, to use this opportunity of rebuilding our, our country, our state, for the next generation, to make sure that Tomorrow, Armenia will be better than today, and the day after tomorrow will be better than tomorrow. So that's the huge opportunities that are ahead. I believe that this nation is, is mature and wise to not... Uh, is mature and wise to use this historic opportunity. I'm very optimistic. So do you see any pitfalls? Well, the pitfalls are, are, as, are, are as usual in, in individual life as well. You can have wonderful opportunity, but if you miss it, then you missed it. I think this is a wonderful opportunity to channel the, whole, the huge energy that has been created during this one month, the positive energy, the positive energy of expectation and hope and freedom, and, uh, and responsibility to channel it into uh, creative work, be that creation and the rebuilding or building and making stronger our, our state, the institutions of the state, be that ministries, departments, because that's the only way to run the country. So first of all, that's opportunity to make that stronger, better, much more efficient and optimize it. The second thing is to really open the door for every Armenian that believes that he has something to offer to his homeland, to have this opportunity of investing time, energy, professionals, know-how into this country. But if we miss it, that will be, well, I will be very, very unhappy because this is a great opportunity for generations ahead. Mr. President, if you could have a magic wall, what are the two most urgent and fundamental things that should happen first? For me personally or for the country? <laughs> for me personally, if I would have my magic wand, I would like immediately to, 
to see all the children, younger generation of this of this country living in a living in a peaceful, successful, wonderful country. The country is wonderful. The country is ma magic country. And I would like to use this want to make sure that the world recognizes not only uh, th that this country can create uh, a unique way of changing a political system, that this country can not only be proud of, of, of its heritage, that this country is a country that has survived the genocide, uh, that this country sees as, a, as a remembering the genocide, as we sh showed on the 24th of April, that we are a nation that we, put us, we can put aside all of our differences and eventually come together, despite our differences, political or, or uh, even belonging to different parts of the society or being poor or rich, doesn't matter. We all are united when it, it's matters and the remembrance of genocide matters for the whole nation. So I'm very proud of that. So if I had a, a wand, I would like to make sure that every Armenian continues this belief in, in the fact that they are citizens of Armenia. So it doesn't disappear because all our future successes will be connected with one fact. Do we really believe that the future of this country is in our hands. Do we know that there is a huge responsibility, not only on the Prime Minister, President, Speaker of the Parliament, MPs, Ministers? No. The responsibility is on every and each Armenian, be that in Armenia, in Artsakh, or in Diaspora. Mr. President, what message do you want to leave to that big audience, the community? Well, the message is that that I'm here to serve the country and the state and the interests of the nation, and I'm going to be uh, open and accessible, and I'll be taking initiative to try to meet each of you personally. If you visit Armenia, you're all welcome to come here. If I am in, uh, in if I'm traveling anywhere in Europe or the United States or anywhere in the world, my doors will be open for you, because I do think that neither president or minister, prime minister, we cannot basically achieve what we want to achieve alone. You are sons and daughters of Armenia. You have to be sons and daughters, and no matter where you live, doesn't matter do you carry American passport, uh, Argentinian passport, French passport, or you have the Armenian as well, or you carry only Armenian passport. You have to believe that you are a part of this great nation. So, well, I hope one day at the end of my term of president, at least I will be able to say that all of these years I achieved something to be not the president of the citizens of Republic of Armenia, but also the president of all Armenians worldwide. Not by name, but by work and hard work to make this country great. Thank you. We're grateful to the president for making the time. We sent the questions and he gave us his best, so thank you again. I also want to thank and apologize Irina Raplanian, Dr. Raplanian, for not introducing her when I introduced the last panel. Before I invite you out to join us in a simple reception and continue this conversation, I want to say something about three W's. The first W is women. Uh, the government of Armenia... That was easy. The government of Armenia and the diaspora have the same challenge. We need to not just in, be more inclusive about women, but also making paths open and available in order to benefit from the entire nation. And what we can do at the Institute, we are prepared to do, and we're also prepared to make those same processes available to the organizations, the institutions, and the government of Armenia, number one. Number two, Washington. 
We're taking this theme to Washington on Tuesday. The Institute of Armenian Studies, together with the Brookings Institute, and the Brookings Institution, and Georgetown University, we're doing a typical Washington roundtable for policymakers, Congress, the media, about Armenia tomorrow. Just wanted you to know. That was Thank you. I, I, this is the time. This is the time to own this topic and make it a topic about Armenia and not about all of the other things that it usually become. So we're happy and proud to be able to do it. And the third W is welcome. We welcome your presence here. We welcome your continued interest and engagement in the Institute. And we would welcome you as donors and partners. This is an expensive process. The research that is going to be re required to be of service to the institutions and the organizations in Armenia that require it and need it, and to the diaspora as it re-examines our role as individuals in the diaspora, as institutions in the diaspora, and as an adjunct, a part of, an annex to, a partner with Armenia. All of that is going to take work, both this kind of work, making the research, the scholarship accessible to the public, as well as supporting the research itself. So we look forward to welcoming you and having you join our Re Leadership Council and our group of wonderful donors. Thank you for being here. Please share the hashtag and the video, which will be online, and join us for coffee and tea outside. <laughs>